Hello, my name is Ray Hughes, and I'm the interviewer for the Veterans History Project out of Washington, D.C., and conducted by the Cincinnati Hamilton County Public Library. Today we are uh, recording at the Marriott in Hamilton, Ohio, and today's date is the 25th of April, 2017, a Tuesday. And, and we have the honor and privilege of interviewing Bobby Osborne today. And it's a pleasure to meet you, sir. Thank and you, Ray. All right nice to, to call you, you Bobby. Too. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, and Bobby is um, not only a renowned musician, but uh, he's a veteran of the Korean War and uh, was a member of the United States Marine Corps. And if we could, Bobby would just get some biographical information about you, uh, where you were born and your date of birth. And yeah, I was born December the 7th, 1931 in Hyden, Kentucky. It's where my mom's people were from. And uh, my dad's people were from over on Thousand Sticks or Bull Creek, we call it. And so four miles across the mountain. And when you got over there, there wasn't nothing there except the creek running. But uh, I was born in Hyden, Kentucky, on December 7, 1931. 105 in the morning, they tell me. 105 <laughs> in the morning. Uh, yeah. Did you have uh, many brothers and sisters? Got one brother and one sister. Uh huh. And were they musicians also? Sonny was my brother. And uh, my sis, she started out with us uh, playing the guitar and singing. But uh, she chose to get married and have a family. And Sonny and me went on to to do what we did for 50 years together. What was your sister's name? Louise. Louise. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. My brother's name was Sonny, and, and uh, his name was Sonny Roland Osborne, and he never did clearly, he never did like to be called Roland, so he, we, everybody called him Sonny, you know, but that was, uh, he and I spent 50 years together recording and, and uh, became members of the Grand Ole Opry in 1964, so we had a, had a nice career together, and he chose to retire here about 14 years ago, and and uh, I just couldn't, I think, I don't know, I believe I was put here to sing, <coughs> sing all my life, and and uh, so that's what I'm going to do, and he chose to retire, he just got, he just got tired of traveling and all that, you know, but me, I'm still right here and right out there, and here today talking to you, Ray. <laughs> what schools did you go to when you were a boy? Uh, well, I went to school over in, th in, in uh, Bull Creek or Thousand Sticks. Thousand Sticks is the county seat up in Boys. I don't know, count of livestock, there ain't very many people live over there, but uh, uh, I went to school there just a little little bit in probably in the first grade and, and uh, later on uh, up to the third grade. And then my dad moved he moved away to get work to do, and uh, he went to Radford, Virginia first and and stayed there for a while. I, I went to school there for uh, maybe the fourth grade or something like that. Moved back to uh, Thousand Sticks for a while, and then then he found work in Ohio, so he moved to Dayton, Ohio, and I started there in the fifth grade. And uh, so, I finished up the eighth and two years of high school, and my dad retired. He he retired from National Cash Register there, and and uh, stayed there 50, 50, 50 years, I guess, or something like that, at retirement age. So, um, and uh, I went to school there to through the tenth grade, and uh, got into trying to sing and play, and I just loved it so well, and I. I just, uh, I wanted to do that. I made up my mind that's what I was going to do. Of course, I, I, uh, I did a stint in the Marine Corps when I was uh, in 51, I guess, 1951, and uh, went to Korea and did a tour of duty there and, and come back. When I got out of the Marine Corps, I got right back to what I'm doing now, singing and playing. Mm -hmm. So I, I've just been, uh, been kind of, uh, uh, just stuck to the, my singing and playing. I just, and when my brother wanted to retire and get out of it, he wanted me to quit with him, and I just couldn't see him doing that. And I, I just, I was just 
believe I was born to put here on this earth to sing and play until until my time was up, and that's and I've I've been doing it for close to sixty years now. Mm -hmm. So you um, uh, when you went in the Marine Corps, uh, what was the date that you went in the Marine Corps? Uh, November the twenty seventh, nineteen and fifty one. And I understand you joined the Marine Corps uh, rather than waiting to get drafted or something. No, I was I was tied in. I was working. Uh, I was doing real good at this when I first got started, and I didn't. I hated to leave what I loved, and that's what I I, I chose to be. Wait till the draft come along, and they they when they drafted um, they were drafting people for for the Army and the Marine Corps, and the reason and uh, one reason I had to. After I took the Marine Corps, I chose the Marine Corps, and I went down to be uh, to be examined, not examined, but uh, take the oath of being drafted into the uh, military. Uh, the guy told us, he said, uh, he said, some of you are going to have to go. Well, first of all, my mom had five brothers. They were all in the, in the Army and uh, Navy and uh, and my one one uncle was uh, uh, in the uh, 17th Air Division. He and he he joined that after he got into the army. And he told me he said, "Don't take that." He said, "That's." <laughs> he said, "I had my fill of that." But the rest of them was had had one in in the Navy, and uh, then the rest of them was in the army. And they they both served and all of them served in the Second World War. And uh, my. Uh, uh, I don't know. I didn't. I was not familiar with uh, any branch of service. I mean, you know, where they were good, bad, or half, or what, you know. But uh, uh, all my my mom's brothers told me, says, "Well, just don't don't take the Marine Corps. That's the roughest stuff that you can get in." He said, "I, I chose to do the 17th Airborne Division." He said that was rough, and I, I regret doing that. But he said they gave me the chance to do that, and and uh, he said, it's, it's just a rough outfit. And I wanted the roughest they had, and he said, that was it. So he said, but I said, well, I, I'm kind of chicken. I don't want the roughest, roughest. He said, well, don't take the Marine Corps. So anyway, we're down in Cincinnati. I, w I was drafted from Cincinnati here, you know, and uh, or down there. <laughs> uh, and the guy said, well, he said, the, he said, the Army is, is full. He said, some of you are going to have to go in the Marine Corps. And he said, I don't know who we are, who's going to go, but he said, if you're chosen for either one of them, that, that's the one you're going to be drafted into. And he said, uh, he said, I will say this. He said, you can take the Army and you go up into Fort, and this was like November. He said, you can take the Army and you go up into Fort Meade, Maryland, and said, you'll, you'll freeze your butts off up there. He said, you can take the Marine Corps and you go out to sunny, good old sunny California where it's really nice. And then I thought, that's for me right there. <laughs> <laughs> so I took the Marine Corps. <laughs> Come to find out after I got out of the Marine Corps and George Jones, he was a, he was a Marine. So yeah. we, he and I hit it off pretty good. <laughs> you, uh, where'd you go for your basic training? At? San Diego, California. He told yeah. me, he said, you went to old sunny California. So I went to San Diego, California and took the basic training and went on up to uh, Oceanside and took the uh, combat training from there. And from there I went to Korea. Um, now what division and regiment were you in? First Marine Division uh, and Easy Company. Okay. Third squad I guess it was. Yeah. <laughs> You're a rifleman? Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. So, uh, I spent uh, most of my time in that trench line up at the 38th parallel and right up front. I, I trained to be a mortar, a mortar guy. But they said you, 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 and you, and that was me. Said you go to the to the, to the rifle company. So I never I never got a chance to do what I was trained for. So I became a part of the infantry and the rifle company. And that's the toughest spot to be in. Well, it, it was uh, it was it was that was time at Bunker Hill in Siberia and and, and uh, uh, all those places of being hit every day. We were on the on the uh, our side, and of course the the uh, uh, North Koreans was on the communist side, and of course uh, 
they they were all the time attacking us and we had to go get them. So I was I was right in that trench line for months and months up there, about six months before I ever acted as up there about seven seven or eight months, uh uh they gave me a job in the back in the in the in the in the rear they called it. And I got to stay back there the last three months I was in Korea, which was really nice duty and thank God. And uh, yeah, I got wounded once uh, while I was there, and I got I got over that and everything. Where, uh, how, where, how were you wounded? Uh, uh, we was on a raid one night and uh, trying to pick up some prisoners. It was on an outpost that we was, went and hit the night. Me and I was in a it was thirty thirty two of us or something like that on this raid and. Uh, uh, our job was to go up to, to go up to these where this, the uh, communists was dug in and and uh, to collect prisoners. And they was, they counted about fifteen of them in this in this outpost for them like, watching us. So our job was to get some prisoners and and bring them back. And I got uh, as I see, well, I got wounded that night. And me and another little guy, we were late getting back, so we counted. I was three hours. Uh, missing in action for a while. Of course, my mom and dad was all, uh, they were were uh, contacted and told that, you know, first, and they thought I just missing in action. And then, of course, uh, uh, when me and this little guy, we found our way to, uh, after the raid was over with, everything kind of quietened down, me, he and I got back to the air mine land. And so, we uh, we found we had to walk we walked through a couple of minefields and over this there getting back but uh, we got back and then my mom and dad got another where I was just wounded in action and and uh, what happened to me is uh, I got hit by a shrapnel I had the helmet on when uh, I lost the helmet of course and the shrapnel hit hit the helmet went right through it I guess and got me up in here and right down through there. And uh, it, it was just, uh, it was so cold in the wintertime, it was real cold. That's the only thing that saved my life. I would have bled to death had it been warm weather. But that blood just uh, just felt like somebody poured warm water down over your face. It put, and there was no feeling to it. It was just hot steel. It, it went right through my helmet and into my... Thank God for the helmet. Just, you know, yeah, I lost it. I wish I could have found it, but I didn't know where it would have put... <laughs> I wouldn't. I didn't hang around and look for it. For it. <laughs> <laughs> but we got back okay, and and uh, uh, I got to, uh, finally got relieved from duty up there at the front lines, and spent the last two or three months in uh, in the rear back there. Got, got to come home. What type of medical care did they give you there, Bobby? When when after you were hit? You know, I don't know. I was I was uh, just kind of out of it when they got. Uh, uh, I, I, I came when I came to myself on the, uh, the on the hillside. There was uh, nobody there was except me. I mean, I was just everybody's gone, and that's how come me being uh, reported missing. Yeah, and another little guy was down. Laying, I heard him a moan, groaning down under the hill. It was just before daylight too, and so I crawled down there where he was at and. His wrist was gone from right there on uh, up that way, so I helped him get back, and then I got back to the main line, and so uh, uh, they was in the squad that I was in. There was like a, uh, a lieutenant and thir and twelve men got killed that night out of out of my squad, you know. And it's me and, and the other boy. We did get back. So, uh, but that they lost their lives that night, and and our people went back to get tried to get them two different times, and lost they lost men both times. So they never they never did get the guys. We we never did. They, and the uh, communists laid them out on a hillside, you know, and. They lay there, and I, I spent uh, six, seven days back in the medical before I came back, and and 
and uh, all these guys laid on that hillside. And finally, our our people, we tried to get them, but we never could. So they flew over them with napalm and burned burned the bodies up, so they wouldn't just completely deteriorate deteriorate laying there. So yeah. that was kind of a bad thing. But uh, um, I was very thankful that I got got back okay, and uh, uh, we lost about half of that platoon I was in that night, you know, getting back. And here I am today talking yeah. to you. <laughs> yeah. um, so you, after you were cared for medically, you went back up front for... for went right back to where I got hit and start the... Yeah. Did you have any buddies and names you recall that you were with there in, on the main line? Just the one little guy that was, uh, that I told you had his wrist uh, blown off, you know. Uh, all of them, I, particularly, I was in with this one little boy from Lancaster, Kentucky, and he and I kind of was in the same fire team together, and and he was a BAR man, I was a rifleman, so uh, uh, he and I was pretty good, pretty good buddies. So uh, uh, he got killed that night. He didn't. He didn't get back, and. Uh, he had told me before that, he said, if, I want you to, I don't know, one day, he just, he just told me, he said, I I want to tell you something. And he said, I, I, I want you to do me a favor. I promise you that you don't do me a favor. I said, okay. So he said, if you know how I get killed, he says, I, my mom and dad, they've got your address at home and everything. He said, they'll come to see you. And my, my parents at the time lived in Dayton, Ohio, and so, uh, I promised him I'd do that. Well, when I got out and went back home, when I got home, they were really waiting on me there. And that's the hardest, one of the hardest things that I ever had to do. I knew he got killed that night on that hill. And it's one of the hardest things I ever mm -hmm. did in my life, just try to tell a mom and dad that how their son that got killed, you know. Yeah. But I promised him that I'd do that, and, and I did. And the reason he got into the Marine Corps is I know his mom and dad, as long as they lived after that, they probably hated that, what they did, you know, the rest of their life. As when he was 18 or something like that, him and this girl left and he got married, you know. And before they had uh, a chance to even live together, my, his mom and dad had it annulled. And he slipped off and joined the Marine Corps and signed his mom and dad to the where he could get into Corps. And uh, that's how he got into the Marine Corps, start with him, uh, kind of that. So that was a sad, had yeah. a pretty sad ending to it. And I've never forgotten that story yeah. right there, you yeah. know. That aid on him, I guess. Yeah, he just, uh, uh, the girl he loved, he, did, he got married to her and he hadn't had to, he get, they wouldn't allow it to happen, you know, he wasn't old enough, so. And his mom and dad, I know they probably hated that mm -hmm. the rest of their life that they yeah. did that, but the, uh, he joined, he just slipped off and joined the Marine Corps and forged their signature, which was okay, yeah. And, yeah. and he didn't make it back. When they pulled you off the line and sent you to the rear, as you called it, what did you do back there? What was your job there? I stood guard duty and then on, uh, over uh, the, uh, uh, to the or the all the tents were back there. I mean, the medical things were set up back there, and uh, uh, new guys coming in and, and going out. You know, I was in the twenty third draft when I went. We went over in drafts, and when and it was a twenty third draft. And with the one you go over in, uh, twelve months later, you get to, you go back in the same draft. You know, so oh, okay. come back home. And uh, I just uh, stood guard duty on on the. That's where they all the the uh, echelons hung out and all that right there back back in the Did back. Did you have any POWs, North Korean POWs there or anything that you stood guard over? No, no, they uh, they had them in, in another place. I didn't have to stand guard with, with any of them, o over them. I just kind of, it was just, uh, they had, they, uh, the Marine Corps just wouldn't let you lay around and not do nothing and pay you. That was just, <laughs> I guess it's, uh, you had to be doing something oh, yeah. to put in your time, you yeah. know. So, But uh, 
We was uh, I had to wait two two weeks extra because I, the uh, they had to wait till the tide come in to get that ship close enough to where we could get a boat and go out there to it and get it. You know, man, I was. Go out there every day, look at that, look at that ocean, see, see that what, ship. What, what the town or city or village will you buy or in? Uh, Seoul, Korea. Oh, Seoul. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And you went to the coast. To went to, uh, landed in in the uh, oh, there's a uh, let's see, I landed near Seoul. It was about a let's see. It's where that famous landing that took Inchon? Inchon. Is it? I landed in Inchon, and that's where, uh, uh, what general was it? MacArthur. Ma MacArthur. Uh, we, we were told that that was where MacArthur and his troops had to hit that beach right there at Inchon. Right on the high tide. That, that was it. And so uh, when they, and they pushed them, they pushed the, the North Koreans, they pushed them back to that 38th peril. And we stopped right there, and that's where the war. And then each side was guarding that little that that thirty eighth parallel that trench line that ran clear across Korea. Yeah. Each each side was guarding that trench line, and we had far fights and going put uh, combat patrols all the time. I was there, you know. Yeah. So and raids. I, the raids what got me that one one night. So, but uh, but I didn't, just it was just a. a, a I just did guard duty back there, and, and uh, for, uh, well, first of all, before uh, before I went to when I first got off of the lines, they put me in a they gave me a desk job, and I, I did that until about a month before I came home, and they let me go back there and get to when I, not get a haircut if I wanted to let my hair grow out and look decent when I got, <laughs> when I got home. Back to the know. state, <laughs> yeah. And uh, but still had uh, had had guard duty every night, you know, make. Make sure that they're. And when you left, though, did you leave out of Inchon when the tide was up? Yeah, or? yeah, we left out of Inchon. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, left right where I came over there, there's where I landed at. And boy, I never forget that day there when I walked off of the land there and got on that little boat and went over to that boat. I, I knew I, I knew I was going to get home that way, yeah. but had to cross the ocean to get here. But that's yeah. that was okay. <laughs> you came all the way on board ship. Yeah, uh -huh. uh -huh. went over on the ship. On the general general uh, Pope and came back on the same ship, and uh, 12 months later, I knew they told us before we left you're going to spend 12 months in Korea. So, but nothing you do but just like it or love it or what you want to do. But then, so then, so, I just I don't know when I went into the Marine Corps though, and, and I, I just I made up my mind I'm just going to make the best of it, and and. And I never did care about uh, getting uh, any uh, being promoted to a corporal or, or staff sergeant or sergeant on up. I, I never. That was not. I, that would not ever on my mind. I not your cup of tea. Yeah, yeah. It just it wouldn't. A lot of guys, they wanted to they wanted to be a corporal where they could tell other people what to do and. The corporals wanted to be a sergeant where he could tell the corporals what to do, yeah. and and I just did what they told me, and I never cared about being anything but a private first class. Well, you were awarded the Purple Heart, of course. Yes, sir, I sure was. And any other medals you care to? Just a uh, 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 rifleman, and uh, I had a bunch of, of uh, buttons you wore on your coat here, and here, but uh, uh, you had to be an expert rifleman to. to uh, now, did you carry an M1 Garand or M1 M M M1 rifles? What I, yeah, what I carry? Yeah. Carabine. I on the raid, I carried a carab carabine carbine. They call yeah, uh -huh. it, and it it was an automatic. I carried that on on the raid because it was light, and the old M1 was pretty heavy. So yeah. If you had to run for your life or something, but the carabine I carried that, and sometimes I carried a 45 uh, on you on you. So oh. yeah. Web belt. Uh, do you go to any of your reunions of the outfit you were with, the Marine Corps? Do they ever have reunions where you go visit to your your buddies? I mean, after you get back? Yeah. No, never did. I was invited to a couple of them, but uh, I just it was so far away. I just didn't. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I was I was uh, I made up my mind. I was going to make the best 
Marine I could, in which I did, and I got an honorable discharge. And and I, when I the day I walked out of the, when, I, when my discharge came up, uh, it uh, it wasn't a discharge; it was a release. I got my discharge seven years later, or something right. seven months later, or something like that. Uh, I just uh, kind of made up my mind I was going to give it my best shot to be a Marine instead of uh, a bluegrass singer, so that's what I did. And now you, uh, how much longer did you have to serve uh, in the Marine Corps after you came back on the Pope? Uh, Thirty uh, a month, I oh. see. Yeah, one month. And where'd you land at when you came back? Uh, San, uh, San Francisco. San Francisco. The little, what, the little town right, that little thing right out of Frisco where the boats came in. Alameda. Uh, no, that don't sound like it. Uh, some some dock right out of Frisco. I landed there when I came back, and uh, uh, my mom and dad drove a drove from. They lived in Dayton, Ohio, then up at then, and uh, my dad he bought a. A brand new Roadmaster Buick to drive in there. They drove to Frisco and, and got me. Is that <laughs> right? When I come home, I met them. I met them there. We so you, drove home. So you were relieved of duty pretty much, pretty soon after coming back. Then. Yeah, I went to. Uh, uh, but you, you went, done your duty though. So. You, yeah, yeah. Well, I went to Washington D.C. for the last. I got a 30-day furlough when I got back from from uh, Korea. And then I had to report back to Washington D.C. and I said, "Guard duty there on the gates, you know. You see that, that going in and out of the base, you know. Yeah. That was I, I, it was an easy job, but uh, you had to uh, you had to learn uh, when lieutenants and colonels and they all came through them gates. You had to learn who to salute and who not to, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'd, get, I'd get called down once in a while, if I'd forget. I'd forget what, who was." You have to look at the buttons on their shirt or the, yeah. the, the things that you say, well, you, I got to salute him, you know, as right. he comes by. But I'd forget that once in a while. And, and of course, I, they, they let me know that you, you're supposed to salute me when I come. Through. I said, oh, I will next time. So, <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> you, uh, I stood guard duty there uh, until I was released from, from Washington, D.C. When was that? Do you recall the date on that, roughly? Uh, it was November the 10th, 1953. 1953. Mm -hmm. So you went in in 1951 mm -hmm. and got out in 1953. Yeah, I went in the 27th of November of uh, 51 and got out. That was released to the 10th of, no of November in 53. Okay. And you spent a did you you spent a full 12 months over in Korea? Yes, sir. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You said that you knew uh, George Jones. He's one of our favorite? Yeah, George. So, how did you meet him and where did you meet him? Uh, of course, you know, uh, I'd heard, I heard his, started hearing his records when he, when he first came out on Star Day Records, you know, and, and I don't know, there was just something about his singing that just really, oh, that I really Lord, liked, yeah. you know, I mean, and I was just among millions, as far as that goes, but, uh, I liked his phrasing, the way he phrased songs, and his, the feeling he put into them. And so, uh, my singing right now, I, 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 uh, you can hear a person knows George's singing and everything, you'll hear a lot of his, his phrasing with, in my phrasing now. But uh, I just, I got to, uh, my brother and me went to, we, we went to Nashville, we was recording then, but uh, we went to Nashville to record, and uh, there's a little place called Tootsie's. Uh, you might have, been, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but every, all the entertainers just hung out in Tootsie's all together. Or, I mean, all the time. And uh, we'd heard about Tootsie's, and it was just a little, it was right behind the Ryman Auditorium, and so handy to get get to, you know. So we, we, we'd heard so much about it, we went down to Tootsie's, and was doing a record session down there. And after the session was over, we went over to Tootsie's, and here's this George in there, and he's about plastered in, you know, so he's getting ready to go to Florida. They had to drag him out of there to go to Florida. And the first time it, uh, the first time I ever seen him, he, we had a song called Each Season Changes You. And when he looked up and seen us, he said, is this my, and I mean, my destiny, I'm sorry. 
is this my destiny? I said, man, you're drunk. You'll never remember me. But he, he I don't know. He, he just, uh, I got acquainted with him, and he was just one of my best, best friends. And and my brother and me went to the opera in '64, and uh, we got uh, I got to know every all of them down there and worked shows with all of them. And Ernest Tubb was one of my favorites. I tried my best to sing like him, but I, well, I didn't. I, my country. voice got so high I didn't sound like him no more. <laughs> so, uh, but I got to know many many country music people I, back then. Uh, in the 50s and 60s. The and real country music. Yeah, that's the way I look at it too. The real country music. I'm, I, I feel, I feel so, I'm, I'm thankful. I'm, I'm really, I'm really thankful that I got to live. I, I feel like I, I got to live in the premier days of country, and country music and bluegrass. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, uh, bluegrass has is, is changed to where it's, I can't play it, so I don't like it. So <laughs> we, we lived on a place called Hell Creek, and we had uh, we had one of them old crystal set radios that we'd hook up. We had a tree out in the yard. We'd run a oh, wire yeah. up, and uh, we'd get uh, Midwestern Hayride on the Saturday nights, you know, mm -hmm. and listen to it every on the weekends. It was a big, big deal, you know, to listen to country. It sure was. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We, uh, we tried to get on the hayride one time, me, uh, Sonny and me did, and uh, uh, they, they said we didn't, they didn't have no bluegrass down there and they didn't want none, so we didn't make it there. But when we got to the Opry, we had uh, we had some good good recordings going, and then they, they we went they asked us to come back and be a guest on on the TV part of the hayride then, so we mm -hmm. went back and when we got out of the car out there to the to the street going to WLWY, uh, they rolled a big red carpet out there for us to walk out. <laughs> uh, that paid. That that was nice there. Oh, I was. <laughs> yeah, see. yeah. I uh, I got to know Ernest Tubb. Uh, he was he was a pure hero of mine, and uh, all of them were great people. I I, I met some wonderful people in, in country music, and the first one I remember that I tried to sing like it was Ernest Tubb, you know, and uh, I just liked his songs and everything, and and I had a chance to go see him. He came to Dayton, Ohio, where Dayton, where we lived, and uh, I told my dad, I, I didn't even have no driver's license in, I couldn't, couldn't, too young to drive, and I told my dad, I said, you, I, you've got to take me to see Ernest Tubb, I want to go see him, so we sat about 10 rows back, and I just watched him on stage that day, and I thought to myself, "That's exactly that's what I want to do right there." And uh, no thoughts of ever in the world ever meeting a guy or anything, but just see him. And when we got to the Opry, I got to meet him in person, you know, and worked a lot of shows with him. And uh, I used to go out to his bus and sit with him, talk talk with him all the time, and. Between, uh, uh, he'd always stay on his bus before he was introduced to go to the stage. You know, uh -huh. I'd go out and sit and talk with him, and and I asked him one time. I said, and he was, of course, he, Jimmy Rogers was his favorite. Yeah, and everybody knows that by now, you know. But uh, I said, you thought so much. I, I, while I asked him, I said, did you ever know Jimmy Rogers? And my dad was a Jimmy Rogers fan, man. My dad tried to sing like Jimmy Rogers and play the guitar like him, you know, so. And it, my dad taught me three chords on the guitar. That's the only person in the world ever taught me one single thing about about music at all. I learned how to sing on my own, and from there I, I learned to play the guitar. And nobody ever taught me a thing, and I've uh, I fooled with the fiddle and the banjo, man, and the guitar, every one of them. So the bass, I never could, I never could, I never could play the bass, but uh, anyway, I asked Ernest one time. I said, uh, "Did you uh, did you ever know Jimmy Rogers personally?" He says, "No, son. I never, I never, I never met the man." And I said, "You had a chance to." I said, "You got the guitar. He gave you that. His wife gave him the guitar of, of Jimmy Rogers' guitar." And I said, "You." He said, "I had plenty of chances to go meet him." He says, "Well, I'll tell you." He said, "I thought so much." that man right there, he said, 
I did not want to meet him in person. He says, I was so afraid that he'd do something that would make me not like him anymore. And he says, I didn't want that. And he said, so I never met him. I'll be and I says, well, I really, let, I, you're, you're my favorite. And I says, I've been trying to sing your songs all my life. And I <laughs> says, I was, I, I'm going to meet you. And I says, now I've met you. And I said, you, uh, you're everything I thought you would be. He said, thank you, brother, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, ordinarily I don't, stop an interview like this and 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 Brian doesn't ask questions this early but Brian is is so familiar with all the genres of music and uh, he wrote a history of King Records uh, right uh, I know you got a couple questions here I'd love for you to ask a couple if you would well, I got a couple of and this, questions and I got a couple of music questions uh, right but uh, one that's kind of, this, that's both, is your sister was a songwriter. Yes, sir. She wrote a song about, like, uh, I think it was called A Brother in Korea. Had written about me. Right. Yeah. So when did you find out that she had written this song? And then did your brother record that song? He did. Why you were in Korea? He recorded him, him, him and uh, a little group he had together then. And uh, uh, Enos Johnson and Carlos Brock and... Oh, it's about fiddle player. I can't remember his name right now, but uh, he had a band. And they, while I was in Korea, she wrote the song, and they went down and recorded it for Gateway Records. Right. Sure did. Cincinnati. Uh huh. What did you find out about the song? Did you hear about it in, in Korea, or did you find out when you came back about the song? Uh, I think it's when I came I came back because I never got a chance to listen to any any, any radio or programs like that in Korea. So. Uh, but when I got back, and uh, uh, he had recorded on a, on a Gateway label and under his name, Sonny Osborne, you know, and I got to listen to it when I got when I came back. <laughs> but do you remember when you found out about it? Did they tell you, and they gave you the, the seventy-eight or something? Oh, my mom wrote me while I was in Korea. She she wrote me a letter right straight, and she said. Said Sonny, I mean Louise wrote a she wrote a song about you in Korea, and I thought, well, you know, so what? I'm over here and she's there. I mean, he not it was me caring about a song right now. <laughs> so <laughs> you're worried about my staying mom, alive. She wanted me to know that there was a song written about me while I was in Korea. So, uh, but I I did know it while I was over there. Did your sister continue to be a, a songwriter even though she got married? Did she keep at? Uh, no, she kind of just chose to raise a family. She had uh, had a boy and a, and a, and a girl, and uh, she just uh, she chose to just be be a housewife. Well, one of the things I was curious: uh, you're born December seventh, right? That's Pearl Harbor Day. Right? Yeah, that's right. So you were about ten years old when Pearl Harbor happened. Do you remember that day? I, yeah, uh, I, yeah. You don't. You know. You, you better know what you remember when you're ten, not very much, you know, and never had enough sense to know much, but I uh I guess I was more or less told by my mom and dad that uh and of course it just as, as time went on why some when my my date of birth and everything got uh, printed in the papers and everything why uh people come up and say, You was born at Pearl Harbor Day and if you go have to give you a date when you go get a job or something. They'll say, oh, Pearl Harbor Day. So I got acquainted with uh, with it then. But uh, Pearl Harbor was, uh, I was born at, at one o'clock in the morning. It's about the same time that Pearl Harbor got bombed by the Japanese on December 7th. And so I always hate to remember that, what happened on that day, you know, but uh, I couldn't help being born at one o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Well, you talk about your brother and your sister, and I guess your father played. Were you a really big musical family? Did you guys have a lot of music? Well, uh, uh, I'm the only one. My brother and me was the only two that, and, and our our side of the family that uh, really did a lot for for in in, uh, in the music business, you know, but. My mom had five brothers, and every one of them could play a tune on something, you know. Incidentally, what was your mother's maiden name, your your uncle's last name? What? 
my mom's maiden name. Dixon. Oh, Dixon. I'm sorry. Uh, Dixon. 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 Uh huh. And her brothers were all Dixons, of course. They were in the military. You talked about. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. 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 She okay. had five five brothers. They all was in the military, and uh, her her name was a, her maiden name was Dixon. And of course, uh, she married my dad. Made her an Osborne. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. You mentioned that your dad went to Dayton for a job. What was the job that he? Why he moved to uh, Dayton? Why did you guys all relocate to Dayton? The, the job I had. No, your dad. But your dad. Oh, he were He. My dad came. He he left Kentucky. Uh, oh, I think about. Uh, let's see. Uh, Probably uh, maybe 30, uh, 37, 38. I was I was about seven or eight years old when he left. So that, and I was born nineteen thirty one. So that'd be right around nineteen thirty seven. He moved to went to Dayton, Ohio, and got a job. And then six months later, he come and got the family. We moved up there. So what kind of work did he do? He worked at National Cash Register. They made they made. Uh, it's kind of a new company. Well, it wasn't, they were making cash registers at that time. Mm -hmm. They were one of the first first companies to uh, to, to make uh, start making the cash register. And of course, uh, so many a lot of people started making them after that companies, you know. But he worked there. He retired there, and uh, worked there all the time. He, that was the first place he stopped to get a job. He caught a bus and went to Dayton, Ohio, from Hyden. That was the first place he stopped. And got off that bus and went and put in an application. And they hired him right there, and he worked there until he retired. He never, never worked anywhere else. Did you have, uh, have a lot of people that you knew who, who had moved from Kentucky to Dayton? Yeah. Population oh yeah, there was there was a there was a bunch of them. But uh, one guy that sang with me in Sony for a while. He was from, from Hazard, right above Hazard over there. Mm -hmm. Pigeon Roost. Yeah, I know right away. Yeah. Red Allen, yeah, he came from came from there, and uh, uh, we we had uh, I knew uh, of course now my mom's brothers uh, they were uh, all five of them could play uh, some kind of instrument, you know, and uh, but I was having my, my brother, me, and my sister uh, was the only two. Now she's got a she's got a boy, a son. He's part of the Diamond Rio right now. Dana, yeah, Dana Williams. So she married a Williams, so he, he he's a Williams. He ain't no Oliver. He got it in him, but he ain't one. <laughs> <laughs> well, how, how old were you when you started singing and, and playing an instrument? How old were, you, were you already playing in Kentucky, or was it more when you? No, I, no, I was too, I was too, too, too small. I didn't, didn't know nothing in Kentucky, I don't guess. But uh, I was probably about. Uh, Maybe uh, I guess I was 12 years old when I first my, my dad had a guitar, and I started fooling with him. I was about 12 years old. And your brother, he's a little bit younger than you, right? Hmm. Your brother, Sonny. Yeah, he. Uh, I, I Sonny wanted to be a football. But he loved football. He wanted to be a football player, and so uh, I got into playing. Uh, Playing a guitar, and my mom's uncle, uh, my mom's brother, I'm sorry, my uncle, he got into playing, and he was the one I tell you in the paratroopers, you know. 17th Airborne. Uh, yeah, and he got, he loved, play, loved Murray Travis's guitar playing, so that was his d deal right there. And he got good enough to, he got a band that was playing some of the clubs around uh, Ohio. And I was picking an electric guitar, and I was trying my best to play like that guy with Ernest Tubb, you know. Played the guitar, so and I I worked with him for a little while, and he had a band playing around, and I was probably I learned a little bit there, you know, and I've learned to play that electric guitar, and uh, so I got I got started that way, and and finally, uh, uh, and he he played uh, he played around uh, there in Ohio for a while, and moved to California, and he he played all up and down the coast of California. Back when I was in, while I was in the Marine Corps. Well, how come uh, how come you didn't become a honky tonk singer, and, not a, and why did you get into bluegrass? I know bluegrass was kind of coming in with Bill Monroe. Well, I, I started out trying to sing like Ernest Tubb, you know, and learned all of his songs, and and uh, 
but I, I, I don't know, just like overnight when my voice changed, and I, I never, I didn't know a thing more about bluegrass. I was just interested in country music and Ernest Tubb, you know, and uh, uh, I'm trying to hear the Grand Ole Opry one. I, I listened to, when the, when the Opry came on, I mean, that was, my night was over with. I, I was right by the radio, and I was trying to hear Ernest Tubb, and static on an old thing we had, you know, and and I heard that I heard a strange sound coming through that radio and I didn't know what it was. I asked my dad, I said, What is that? I thought I had it on the wrong station, so he said, That's a banjo. I said, What's that? He said, It's it's it's, it's a banjo. So and he played one, he claw hammered one. I didn't know that until later, so but and I and when that when that picking stopped Nobody never said a word, just the audience clapped and that was, and I listened to the opera and listened and listened and never heard it again. I couldn't figure that out. One night I was listening, I heard that same sound again. And I, I run that, I, I kept on till I found out who that was and I found out it was, what the song he played was Cumberland Gap on the banjo and the guy was, was Errol Scruggs and he played with Bill Monroe and the Bluegrass Boys. I learned that much. So Bill came to the Memorial Hall down there and I told my dad again, I said, I gotta go. I says, I can't believe one guy gets all them notes. We sat about 10 rows back again. Scrub showed me in about a minute and a half how one guy could do that. <laughs> so, so, but it got tied in to, and my, about that time my voice changed to, to from low to high and I got to singing Bill's songs and just got tied in and recording. I love the banjo and the fiddle and I, uh, I always wanted to be a fiddle player, but the closest I come to one was the mandolin because it's tuned the same. So I got a fiddle at home and I, and I, I fool with it all the time. I play, I, I, I played it some on the road, you know, but, uh, but the mandolin's the main thing and the guitar and, and uh, but that's, that's how I got into bluegrass is through, uh, through listening to Earl Scruggs and while he was a bluegrass boy. How, how old were you when your voice changed? Do you, do you I was about 16. Yeah, I was right around 16. I don't know, one day I was talking low and the next day I was just, I, I was singing a song and I thought, man, that's too low or something, something wrong there. And I, I kept getting it a higher key and a higher key and it went right on up. And, and, and I heard Bill Monroe's voice, it was kind of high and, God, I could sing his song just like him, in the same range he was. I knew right there something had happened to my voice, you know, I just, just, it just changed. So it stayed there and what little of it's left today is still there. <laughs> well, when did you uh, pick up the mandolin? Uh, about 1950, uh, hmm, let's see, about 1950. I learned, uh, while well, I was, let's say, 50, I was, yeah, about 1950. I, 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 I was playing with the Lonesome Pine Fiddlers up in, uh, working with them in uh, Bluefield, West Virginia. I'd quit school, I mean, I wouldn't, uh, my, I gotta tell you a while ago that my, my biology teacher, he wouldn't want to, he, he, didn't, he called me Robert all the time, and I told him a half a dozen times, I said, my name's Bobby, it ain't Robert. I, that's uh, my dad's name. And he just kept on, and uh, my sophomore year, I I sat in a study hall and filled out that sheet. I looked out the window and I said, I ain't ever coming back here again when school was out. And when school was out, I never seen I never seen that teacher or that school again. I quit and went into this right here. And but anyway, I was in West Virginia playing with the Lonesome Pine Fiddlers and uh, uh, playing guitar. And I run into a, a banjo player there, Larry Wretches, and that's how came. Sonny got to know him through me, and that got him interested in the banjo. So he learned to play a banjo by just liking what the sound of one of them. So anyway, but that's how I got into to singing bluegrass, and through through that that right there. Um, did you and your brother? Did, you weren't the the Osborne Brothers yet before you went into the service, were you? Were you guys already performing as a duo yet? Or was that no, 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 I was, with, I, I did it myself. I was uh, 
about three or four years before Sonny ever even got interested in it. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I, I was working with the uh, Lonesome Pine Fiddlers and uh, that's why I was with them when I got my call to the to the service. So no, he, we, uh, when I got out of the Marine Corps, he had learned to play the banjo. Learned to pick one before I, when I got out. And uh, I thought, and I worked with the Stanley Brothers just a little bit before I went into the Marine Corps too. And uh, I planned, I had planned to go back with them. And so, but I got to thinking, what's he used to be doing that? I mean, he plays good enough for me and, I, and he's good as I am for playing. So we just started playing some clubs around Dayton and uh, got up at Red Island and we was in, just playing clubs up there, you know. And we just decided we was good enough to be able to try to get us a recording contract. And we we, uh, we run into a disc jockey, Tommy Sutton used to be at, at uh, W-O-N-E in Dayton. And we run into him and asked him, I knew he came in and out of Nashville a lot, you know, for, because he was went to DJ's conventions and stuff down there. So went, uh, got in with him and uh, he said, if you guys will make me a tape, he said, I'll take it. I know some people in Nashville might be able to help you get a recording contract. So. We made a tape, and Ruby was one of the songs we put on that tape. Is that right? And uh, but Sonny and me had uh, had uh, had learned. I'd learned a little bit about the banjo. I mean, I knew what went on back here, you know, and all that. But uh, I had never played one in front of some anybody. But Sonny <laughs> and another guy, uh, Noel Craigs was his name. They rehearsed Ruby and played two two banjos on it. Well, when Tommy took the tape and went to Nashville, he told Wesley Rose, so they, they've got two banjos they use on Ruby. Well, he was familiar with one through Earl Scrubs, but uh, he'd never heard two. He says, that's what I want. I want the two banjos on the Ruby because that's different. So, Son and Noah got to be uh, rehearsing for that to go and record, you know. And we knew he was going to have to do Ruby for the guy, so... Uh, we, it was about a month before we went to do, to record. Noah just he he disappeared. He just disappeared from the surface of the earth. We never we couldn't find him with a search one. And uh, Sonny had two. He had two banjos. He gave me a set of picks, and he knew I knew something a little bit about here. He said, "There's your set of picks," and they wasn't nobody else in the Dayton area that played one. He said, "There's a banjo and a set of picks." He said, "You got a month." Learn how to play. Just learn how to play Ruby because we got to have that contract. <laughs> That's what I learned how to play Ruby. So I turned to play one part and he played the other part. We went down there and man, I dreaded to get it. I, I dreaded that. I, I dreaded that. I just it's just something about playing something you don't know how to play and trying to get get a recording contract with. It. But um, where did you record Ruby at? In Nashville. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so. Uh, the first one that the guy wanted to hear was Wesley Rose. The first one he wanted to hear was uh, was Ruby. So I, I put them picks on, got that band stood on the box about that high up to the microphone. And we played we played Ruby and he said, that's what I want right there. So we recorded Ruby that day. And, uh, and I've told a story before and somebody said, well, did you ever tell a guy that, that, that that the real guy never did show up. I said, uh-uh, I never did tell him nothing. <laughs> said, he was happy with what I did. That was fun with me. Yeah. <laughs> so, but I, uh, and I got to play on uh, on on three more cuts. I, I played Ruby on, on played the banjo on four more, four more songs before we, uh, before we got, got away from that type of thing. Do you think, how long was that after you got out of service? Was that like a year or two? Probably, it was it maybe a year, uh, maybe, uh, about a year and a half, we uh, we got uh, we got up with Red Allen because he was from right out of hiding over there. I mean, the Hazard, and got up with him. And he his family had moved to Ohio just for, for, for to get work too. And Red had got uh, he got old enough to get him a job, so he 
he was working at a factory up there in Dayton and he had a little band called the Kentucky Mountain Boys and he was playing clubs around in the, in the Dayton area and so was we and we were playing right we were playing on one side of the street and he was playing on another side with it with his band we was over here and between between uh, intermissions he'd come over and listen to us or his group would come over and listen to us and we'd go over and listen to them and we found out he could sing and we needed a singer to, we wanted to do a three-part harmony and we got ready to, and he he dished his group and come and work with us and we got we uh, we got to singing together and the, we went we got on that uh, jamboree in Wheeling West Virginia and uh, this guy up there before we come into the harmony that we were so well known for was uh, uh, we run, run into a man who was on wheel, his name was Dusty Owens. He had written this song called Once More. And boy, I liked the song. I asked him, I said, you think, would you care if we sing that song? He said, no. So he taught me the song that night. Well, on the way, we lived, Red and us both lived in Dayton at that time. And on the way home, we got to singing that song once more in the car. And our instruments was all in the trunk, you know, it was in the wintertime at that. So, uh, we uh, we just sing along with it, just like we always did every song, just regular harmony. And all of a sudden, I just started singing it in another key, singing it the high the high part of it. And Red was a tenor singer when he came with us because he sang tenor in the group he was in. So he just fell in and sung the low tenor part in a lower lower range. So and that made us have the lead was on top and. And uh, the uh, low tenors on the bottom, and then some of part was in the middle. And we got to singing that right there. I never had no idea what key we was in or nothing. And uh, we thought, well, we had never heard nothing like that. I'd never heard of no, anybody singing high, the highest, your high part being the lead. And so we got to get there out of the trunk and see what key we was in. So we dropped it down a little ways where we come from. So, and we sung that song right there all the way to Dayton from Cambridge, Ohio. Just sat there on the guitar and, and sing it. And uh, we knew we had, we, we, we'd learned how, what we did that night because we, uh, we was, was afraid we'd forget it. And we learned, and so we didn't want, we knew that was different. And we, we were already recording for, for MGM Records. And we went down there to we went to do the song once more because it was a, it was a good song, and, and we had that harmony. And we went down there to Wesley Rose, and we told him we'd like to. And he heard that harmony. He said, "You can't do that kind of harmony here." He said, "Ain't nobody wants to hear that." He said, and, uh, he "Said yeah, what's well, different? We said, you know, we don't want to sound like Bill Monroe the rest of our life, you know." And. Uh, he said, "Ah, he said, I, I you just can't do that." He said, I, "I don't, I don't, I ain't never heard that kind of harmony before." And uh, uh, we kept on doing. Let's try it. He says, "You liable to use, lose your recording contract." He said, "You're you're you're supposed to be singing the other type of harmony." And we said, "Well, we'll take a chance on it." So we we recorded. Uh, he let us do once more. And when it came out. They had charts going up to about not uh, about forty, number forty, and hit hit reached sixteen on the charts, and we never heard nothing out of Wesley Rose or more. <laughs> so he, that, we kept that harmony and still got it today. Well, I, I wanted to ask you for I do want to talk a little bit about later on your career, but I, I do want to uh, back up before your service, and you did some recording for King. You did a session for King. Yeah, I know exactly where that studio was at. <laughs> what was, can you compare the, your your the recording experience? I know you only did one session at King, but how was that different from from doing Nashville? Was, I, I figured King was probably a little bit more of a uh, uh, not laid back, but more uh, not not as professional, not as like Nashville was more. No, bigger. you know, the, the man by the name of Sid Nathan run that company, had that company. And of course, Nashville at that time, they didn't have any recording studios. They had, uh, they probably had one. The Castle, Castle uh, 
two, uh, it, it, was, uh, it was in the two lane hotel where right. the castle recorded. castle yeah they might have had that at the time and I think they probably did because that was the only thing they had in Nashville right. so King had Grandpa Jones they had the Stanley Brothers they had Reno and Smiley they had uh, uh, Brown's Ferry Four Quartet they had uh, all those people yeah. recorded Hawk for King Hawk, 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 Hawkshaw Hawk, 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 had some big records on King on King so, so did all of them and King really was it was it was better it was a better place to record than Nashville was at that time there and so when we got to when we got to record for King uh, we sent a tape to Sid Nathan and uh, Jimmy Martin and me got to record for King Records we sent a tape and he took us so we that's how come we come to Cincinnati and uh, but it as far as uh, as far as the studio King had uh, I think they had a better studio than they did in Nashville at the time of course when uh, when they recorded now Monroe when he recorded uh, uh, when Flat and Scruggs was with, with, with Bill and some of them others, uh, the others, uh, you know, had Columbia Records, uh, uh, Mercury Records, DECA, RCA, and all them. Uh, Monroe was recording for Columbia, and they, all those Columbia sides, they went to Chicago and recorded, recorded that. And so a lot of them had to go to Chicago or, or New York. Jimmy Rogers. He recorded in New York because they, they had studios there. Mm -hmm. So they didn't have any studios in Nashville except that one, and I don't think it was put in there until probably after King. King might have been the first first recording studio that was Do you in. Do those memories of that recording session you did at King? King? Sick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm scared to death for that matter. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering if you had a Sid Nathan story. People usually do. Uh, yeah, we had a... Uh, Curly Ray Klein played the fiddle. He was a good, good fiddle player, and Charlie, his brother, was was a, a banjo player. And they were at Bluefield. They we worked with them at Bluefield up there some. And so uh, uh, Jimmy Martin and me, we picked out those four songs. I had three on there. My sister wrote, she wrote a couple of them, I think, and I wrote one. And Jimmy Martin had one he'd written. Well, Sid took all. He said, "Go ahead and just record those four. So we did. But we had Curly Ray Klein playing the fiddle and Charlie, his brother, playing the banjo. And uh, of course, Jim played guitar and me the mandolin. And we had a guy by the name of Ralph Gunther, I think was his name. He was a session guy. I know, yeah, I know the name. Yeah. He, played, he played bass with everybody, I guess. Yeah, he did. And so he, he played bass with us. Well, Curly, was a, Curly Ray was playing the fiddle and he had a, had a solid black fiddle. And, he he would be the dance to jump up and down when he played the fiddle. <laughs> Sid, Sid they, he, when he everybody had a microphone standing around. Curly was trying to dance at that mic and play the fiddle, you know, on on a, on a recording. And Sid come out of that control room and he says, he says, uh, all of you got to listen to this right here. He says, just listen up for a minute. So he had a big piece of chalk and he come over and marked a big X right across Curly's black fiddle, you know. <laughs> He said, I want you to put that X in the microphone. Not the, not, he says, I don't care a thing we're about your dancing. He said, I want the X in the mic. So, <laughs> Curly Kurt, got a big long face, you know, and he's, he's, he had to quit his dancing right there. <laughs> That's the best thing I remember about Sid Nathan right there. Well, that, was, that recording session was just a couple months before you went into the Marines. Yes, it was. Yes. I was. I was wondering, do you know if that record did anything? Did it get played on the radio or? It yeah, it did. I, I probably didn't know anything about it because I went to Marines after that and straight to Korea after about six, uh, eight weeks of, uh, of uh, training. I, I was wondering, did you feel like maybe your career was starting to take off a little bit? And oh now yeah. Now you were about to go oh. into the military. Oh. What were your what were your feelings at the time? Oh yeah, we thought we was halfway home then, so <laughs> doing that, you know. <laughs> but we didn't know we hadn't, we hadn't, we hadn't, we hadn't broke no ice yet, you know. So, um, yeah, I had the hopes of, uh, Jim and me both had hopes of making it big and, you know, it's like a Flatten Scrubs or anybody else, you know. But it, uh, uh, when I went to the Marine Corps, he drifted back, went back to Bill Monroe again and just, uh, uh, 
later when I got back out of the Marine Corps, why, by that time my brother, he had uh, learned how to play the banjo, so uh, Jimmy and me and my brother got back together and we recorded six sides for RCA Victor records. And there again we thought we, we thought we had a good start going getting into the business again. So, uh, but uh, Jim was just a hard, he was a hard person to get along with and we just never, uh, we did six, six sides to start with for RCA. But uh, Jim chose, he chose to go his way and we chose to go ours and so it's, that ended that. So we, we had to start all over again, you know, but the second time we started, uh, we started with Red Allen again, and that didn't, after three years, that that didn't work out there either. So, well, Red was pretty. He was he was pretty bad to drink, you know. And of course, Jim was too. And so, it just, I just had something else on my side, on my on my mind besides drinking all the time, you know, and all like that. So, but anyway, uh, when Sonny and me started together, we just figured well, we brothers, we, we got a better chance of staying together than anybody, so we just we stayed together until he quit. Well, I think we forgot an important thing, but we might have to ask, how did you meet your wife? Karen's my second wife, mm -hmm. and so I met, uh, my first wife met her through the guy I worked for in, in West Virginia. Okay. She was a daughter, yeah. When did you guys decide to move from Ohio to Tennessee to make the move to Nashville? When we, uh, uh, I would never move there, and Sonny wouldn't either until we, uh, we were Aka, we were with Aka Froze, and we tried to get them to help us get on the <coughs> opera, and they didn't, they just never did have any headway with it at all. And, and uh, Ted and Doyle of the Wilburn Brothers, we got to know them pretty good, but we worked shows. Uh, while we was at Wheeling, we worked some shows with them. And they always loved that harmony that we did because they, they had, for brother harmony, they had good harmony, great, great harmony. So, uh, Doyle gave me a little card at the opera and he said, if you ever decide to make a change, just give, give me a call. I didn't know much about their, their, their organization or anything like that. I hung that card for, gosh, I don't know, maybe six months and weeks. We were checked in a hotel up in Wil uh, Wilmington, Delaware, and we were deciding whether we were going to quit or just go on or what. And I had that card. I pulled that card out, and I said, well, Doyle Weber gave me this card, and said, if we ever want to make a change, why call him? So we was not signed with MGM Records at that time, and uh, Sonny just up and made a phone call. It was about 9 or 10 o'clock at night, I think. And, he made a phone call and Do uh, Doyle answered the phone and Sonny said, told him we was thinking about making a change and he says, well, give me till Wednesday and he said, I'll, he said, call me next Wednesday and I'll, I'll see what I can do. So we was in Columbus playing at, at another club up there playing and uh, uh, we called Doyle back and from in, in one week, he had us recording contract, the Decca Records, uh, and uh, of course they had a they had a talent agency that of their self plus a publishing company. And he says, if we, he said, and they also had us after him. They had a TV show early in the morning. He had us on that, and uh, uh, we made some of these Air Force shows, a big old big records they used to make and play. And uh, he did all that in a week, and then uh, then we had to get away, make up Rose. So we had to wait, had to sign a release, and go through all that to get away from the, that label to sign with Decca Records. So we we went through all that, and we got we got that recorded contract with Decca Records, and and uh, we stayed there until we till they uh, signed him one day. He he wanted to change change labels, and so I think that was one mistake that we made. And so, but we had some good had some good recordings on Decca Records. Well, I know we only got a couple of minutes, but 
my, my last question, maybe Ray might have a little, but uh, I was curious in how you guys decided to, to go electric, like you plugged in your mandolin and your amp and stuff. I was wondering, did that develop slowly or was that like over the No, we had, uh, there was a promoter named Carlton Haney. He, he, he started the Bluegrass set, the Bluegrass festivals. We got to work some shows for him. Virginia, right? Mm-hmm, yeah. right, right. I used to run Rono somewhere in that vicinity, I believe. And we got to work, he, Carlton, uh, he had, he, he was booking every country act that they was. Him and another guy was in partners, and uh, he, he, he just always wanted to hire us for some reason or another. And uh, he hired us to do all of his country shows along with, I mean, all of them, Conway, Loretta, Merle Haggard, uh, Ernest Tubb, all the, all the people at Opry, he worked all of them. And every, every show that he had, he had us, he had us on every, every one of them. I asked him one time, I said, how come it's you? And he always, he loved Bill Monroe. I said, looks like you'd have Bill Monroe on, on, uh, on your package shows instead of the Osborne Brothers. We were we were had gotten to be members of Opry by then, and Carlton had that Virginia accent, you know. And he looked at me and he said, "Well, he said Bill Monroe. He said he won't bring him in the door. He said y'all boys will. <laughs> so he said that's why I book you all boys all the time. <laughs> so uh, we got to work, and that was that was like thirty days a year. We didn't have to worry. We had top money, and so we had that. We worked for Carlton." all them shows so that plus and it, then when he started the bluegrass festivals we didn't have to worry about nothing man we had every, every year had it planned ahead you know so that's how we got to but how did you start uh plugging oh, your, oh your that there okay we uh yeah. see on all those country music shows man they played the coliseums and them things held in worth from 10 to fifteen thousand people and suddenly me we couldn't afford but just one other guy there's a sing with us Dale Sled was his name, and Carlton would be to have us on all them big shows. I remember that. Remember that Greensboro, North Carolina Auditorium. I think it helped fifteen thousand people. Here's three guys walk out there in front of three, fifteen thousand people. Just three of us. Man, you could hear people just they'd just be telling jokes out there in the crowd while we was on. Nobody paid no attention. To you know, I mean they they recognized the songs because it, the DJs played the, our songs up his hill and down because we had a different sound all together. So we got the airplay, but they knew who it was, but they couldn't hear us. That was the main thing. We were up in uh, Minnesota, Minneapolis, Minnesota, playing a club, boy. There's an old music store right across the street over there. And we was, th we was talking about if we could be heard, people, they, uh, if people could hear us on stage, that big package shows we could go over as good as Conway Twitty and Laura Lynn or all of them, you know. So we went across the street over there and we all three bought pickups. And they had, amp we didn't have to worry about the amplifiers because that club had all, they had the amplifiers in there. We went over and got three pickups and put them on our instruments and brought them over and plugged them in, <laughs> plugged them in that night. And boy, you had, we had to, had to learn to play through it, that loud, you know, everything, you know. And man, I, I, I got mad on this peeling that paint right off the wall. <laughs> 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 and so people said, Oh, man, turn the thing down them high notes, they killed me, you know. And we learned how to do that. And so, but I'll tell you what, everything we did on that stage that night, them people stood up for us. They, li they liked everything we did. We learned right there. That's what we got to take on them package shows and just peel the paint off them walls, and people hear what we're doing. So we did that. And uh, and we 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 were, we were accepted by the country, the country audience. Then I tell you one more funny thing about that Monroe. He didn't he didn't he didn't he didn't want nothing to do with electricity at all. And he got mad at us. He got mad at us for hooking ours up and playing with through them. And we went and bought man. I went and bought me a big twin river and Sonny had a bass amp about that high. And we was we was we were ready to go guitar player. We all had amps and carrying. Finally, my oldest, oldest son, he's playing the snare drum with me right now, he come along and learned to play the full set of drums. So we, we, 
we got we we got to where we was carrying a, a full set of drums and everything with us. So we were. Uh, uh, let me see what I was going to say there. Talking about Bill Monroe. Oh yeah, it? we knew that, that Bill. He he didn't like. Uh, he told me, "Come in. I don't like that liquor stuff. That that that, that that's no good for nothing up there." And I said, "Well, what do you like?" Well, he said, "I like my man, and I don't care nothing about that stuff right there." He said, "You shouldn't be playing that right there like that." And uh, the fact is, we uh, we we was going to take them amps and go to Bean Blossom up there. He said that he called he called our, our booking agent up. He said. Uh, you tell them boys they can come up here, but uh, leave that electric stuff down there. We don't want that up here. And so uh, that's how he talked. And I used to talk to him just like he talked. He never just said a word about it. So, uh, <laughs> uh, I'd come in the dressing room and I'd say, "How you doing, Bill? I find out how you do it." <laughs> but he didn't. Uh, he never just said a word about that. I don't know if he ever called it or what. You know. But, but that, you know, I didn't care for one reason. But anyway, anyway, <laughs> Bill never cared for that liquor stuff. And uh, uh, we was at the Opry one night, and, and I, Hank Snow had a little thing, and he had them at the control. He had a a, a, a plug in right at the uh, mic. He played his guitar through a little, through a, a little mic, the house PA, you know. And he plugged into that thing. Well, I talked to the guy upstairs. And I said, and I had one of them little stretchy cords. That it, it, it would stretch out that long, but it'd go together. You just put the put the plug in your pocket and walk around with it. Nobody could tell that you had a pickup on the mountain. And I had one of them little Barker's Berry things stuck between the bridge, you know. And we was on was guest on Bill's program down there one night. And I went out there and I plugged that mountain. And then the guy put the top up there. He told me, he said, when I put the, he said, just turn your and I had a volume control on my mantle and everything. He said, just crank it up. And he says, I'll take care of it from there. So we go out there that night. We did fireball mail. Boy, and I turned, I, I had that mantle crack. I just peeled the wall, the peel of paint right off the wall of that rhyming auditorium, you know. And when Bill got up, when he got off that show, he come, oh, come here, Bob, come here a minute, I want to talk to you. He said, what kind of mantle you got? I said, it's like yours. No, sir, it ain't like mine. Mine don't sound like yours. <laughs> I never did tell him I had a pickup on it, man. <laughs> he never did know. And he finally brought he, he finally brought us back to Bean Blossom. We, we worked ten years without going up there. We finally went back. <laughs> <laughs> but he that was one funny story about the about the, the electric thing right there. Um, well, <clears throat> it looks like we're coming to the end of our allotted time. But I want I got a funny feeling that. We ain't scratched the surface of of your career, but well, it's, well. It, it's been a real honor and a pleasure to meet with you and get your story. But well, I, I wanted to first of all thank you for your service to our country. Well, thank you. Joined Korea and the United States Marine Corps. And, well, I and, I, uh, and thank, thank I, you. I did just like ever everybody else. When they called me, I went. You know. Yeah. I laid down what I wanted to do and went and served my country, and I thought it was my duty to do that, and I, I did that, and I got back okay, and here I am today. It's been 50, let's see, 51 till now. It's been over 50 years, I know, that I was in, served in the Marine Corps, and I, they say all, once a Marine, always a Marine. I guess I'm still a Marine yet. Still a Marine. <laughs> well, thank you for your service and thank for you. our interview. Thank you, Ray, and thank you very much for inviting me on your on your on the program here. Yes, sir.